Um, so for our final presentation, we are being joined by Sarah Wilson. Sarah has, has practiced as a licensed midwife since 2019. She has also been faculty at Mercy in Action College of Midwifery since 2019. In collaboration with Dr. Sam Mishra, she developed continuing education focused on collaboration in the field for midwives and EMS across the state of Michigan. Tonight, Sarah's presentation, Out of Hospital Births, will focus on the following objectives. Describe a normal in-home delivery, outline how EMS pediatric champions and PACs can improve their readiness to care for laboring mothers and newborns, identify three common emergencies for which a midwife may call for EMS support, and to recognize the importance of communication to improve care of the laboring mother in the newborn field. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. I will turn it over to you. Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Okay, and does my slide show up? It's just we're yeah. actually um, we're actually seeing the um, preview of the next slide. Okay, um, I'm gonna change that then. So, thank you. Okay, is this better? Yes. Now we only see the current slide. All right. Perfect. All right, well, thank you, Erica, for that introduction. And I am excited to be here with you today. And I was so thankful to be invited by Dr. Mishra um, to be able to share with you how um, certified professional midwives and EMS can collaborate in the field. So we're gonna get started because we have a lot of information to cover. So um, like she said, our objectives are to understand who certified professional midwives are in their scope of practice, to understand what an out-of-hospital birth looks like, to discuss steps to achieve a smooth and safe handoff and transport to the hospital. Um, we're also gonna discuss how we can collaborate as healthcare professionals in an obstetric transport situation and what improves outcomes for our patients. And then we're gonna review some emergencies that are common um, during an out of hospital birth. And then I also want to highlight um, what, is, uh, what a birth looks like that is progressing normally. All right, so for those of you who might not know what a certified professional midwife is, um, it is a knowledgeable, skilled, and professional independent midwifery practitioner who has met the standards for certification set by the North American Registry of Midwives, which we call NARM, and is um, qualified to provide the midwives model of care. Um, the CPM is the only midwifery credential that requires knowledge about and experience in out-of-hospital settings. And I just wanted to review what the midwives model of care looks like. Um, when we uh, are with our clients, we monitor the well-being of the mother throughout their childbearing cycle. So this includes prenatal care, labor care, and postpartum care. We really um, desire to provide individualized care, which means we really look at each of our clients holistically and address the needs that they specifically have throughout their pregnancy. We value minimizing technological interventions. Um, we really believe that um, the mother has a choice in what she chooses to um, like the tests that need to be done um, and, and things like that. And we always present the risks and benefits of everything and provide informed consent. And so um, we are really a team um, as we work together with our clients to decide what is best for them and their baby. And then when it is necessary, we always refer to women who require obstetrical attention because out of hospital births are for clients that are low risk. And the midwife's model of care really has proven to reduce birth injury, trauma, and cesarean. So we really um, value these, um, uh, these things within our care. 
All right, so I just wanted to highlight here um, where midwives, where certified professional midwives are licensed. And as you can see, all the states that are represented in this seminar are um, all have licensed midwives practicing in their state, which is super exciting. Um, Illinois um, just recently became, um, the midwives there have become licensed. So that is really exciting. And um, uh, at the states that are in yellow, many of them have legislation on the table waiting for it to be approved so that the midwives can practice there as well. Um, Michigan, um, I'm from Michigan, and um, uh, we were licensed in 2019, and I just think it is a wonderful thing to regulate um, midwives and um, provide uh, access to wonderful care from midwives. So I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what it is a midwife, a certified um, midwife needs to do in order to become um, certified. Um, the education for a midwife requires um, extensive educational curriculum. We cover over 750 topics. I teach um, at a midwifery college, and so uh, we spend a lot of time um, going through um, uh, what prenatal care, um, labor and birth care looks like, and postpartum care. Um, in order to become a midwife, you have to have supervised clinicals. Um, it's equivalent to over 1,300 hours of supervision, and this generally takes three to five years to complete. We also have to complete a rigorous eight-hour written board exam, and we have to pass a hands-on skills assessment with a qualified examiner. In order to continue as a midwife, just like yourselves, we have to have continuing ed education. We participate in regular peer review to remain certified. We hold a valid certification in adult and infant and neonatal resuscitation. And we utilize informed consent with all of our clients. So we have tons of documents that talk about all the different tests and, and things that are available to them and what the risks and benefits are. And we have plans and protocols um, that show our practice guidelines, and we have protocols that address emergency care um, uh, plans. Um, again, every state um, has a different set of laws and regulations regarding their midwife's license. So um, as CPMs, we all follow NARMS regulations, but um, each state has its own individualized um, laws and regulations that the midwife will follow. So this presentation, um, we're just going to talk in general because it might be a little bit different from state to state what a midwife um, a midwife's protocols can and cannot be. So I just wanted to glance at what we do in the prenatal period, um, the antepartum care, this is prior to birth. This is the kind of care we give. We provide regular prenatal visits that monitor the mother and baby's well-being. Um, this is very similar to what OB visits look like. Um, we use shared um, decision-making and evidence-informed care in determining risks for out-of-hospital birth. So we're always discussing with our clients um, if there is a risk that presents, uh, what are the risks and benefits of whatever it is that is presenting, and we decide whether or not that is safe for an out-of-hospital birth or if transfer is, is necessary. Um, in the state of Michigan, we can order lab work, ultrasounds, and other pregnancy-related tests. Um, again, each state, it, it varies. Um, we do provide routine pregnancy screening, such as GBS screening and um, gestational diabetes screening. Um, and again, we consult, refer, or transfer, transfer um, clients to other healthcare professionals when needed and if they go outside our, our um, rules and regs. So during birth, um, we um, monitor the fetal heart tones with something called a handheld Doppler through intermittent auscultation, which research shows has proven to be safe. Um, mo we monitor the mother's vitals um, continuously. We monitor the newborn's vitals once the baby is born. We also perform the initial newborn exam, 
We are again trained in NRP and CPR, and we are trained in um, many childbirth emergencies, um, such as resuscitation of the newborn, postpartum hemorrhage, shock, um, et cetera. So intrapartum care, um, we also administer pharmaceuticals. And again, this is, varies by state, but some examples of this would be oxygen, intravenous fluids, antibiotics for group B strep treatment, anti-hemorrhage meds. So this would be like Pitocin, but again, we only use these after the birth. We never ever induce a labor with medication. Um, we can use vitamin K, erythromycin, and lidocaine for suturing if the mother experiences a vaginal laceration. And we carry our large birth bags to every birth with us, and it contains a lot of equipment to handle certain emergencies. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are just some of the things that we carry, um, such as sterile equipment for clamping and cutting the cord, a handheld Doppler, catheters, pulse ox, um, all the resuscitation equipment necessary for NRP and LMA, blood pressure, stethoscope, um, sterile gloves, pads, gauze, et cetera. So we just want you to know that when, if you were to arrive um, and a midwife is there, a certified professional midwife is there, they will have many of the things to handle the emergencies that um, might be presenting. All right, so we also provide extensive postpartum care for our clients. Um, we really value postpartum care. We think it's essential to getting the mother and baby off to a good start. And so we provide regular visits. And these visits look like we, we go at 24 hours, um, three days, uh, one week, three weeks and six weeks. So we're visiting the mother quite a bit. And if obviously there's anything that arises, we will visit them more often. We also help with breastfeeding. And as we all know, breastfeeding is essential for the mom and the baby and it's so healthy for them. And we want to um, encourage that breastfeeding relationship as much as we can. Um, we also provide, and again, this varies by state, but we also provide the CCHD screening, the hearing screening, and the newborn blood spot screening. So we do all of those in the home. And again, some states may not do all of those screenings, allow their CPMs to do all those screenings, but in Michigan, we are able to. And then we always are screening for postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. All right, so um, I just wanted to take a moment here and kind of um, look at what a home birth looks like. We understand that, like, I understand that many of you have probably encountered um, out of hospital births and they might, um, and many times you're going to these births because there is an emergency. And I just wanted to highlight that um, for out of hospital births, um, we transport about 10% of the time. Therefore, 90% of births progress normally and the family stays at home. And I know that you guys don't see that very often, um, what a normal birth looks like and what our, our job looks like um, uh, outside the hospital when a birth is progressing normally. So I just wanted to share a quick YouTube video about a, a birth that occurred at home. And you can see the midwife in the background monitoring the birth. And so I'm gonna click on this and we'll just take a glance at this for a little bit. Just gonna forward along just so we don't run out of time. You're gonna have to change your view, Sarah, to, sh to share the screen that it's on. It's on your front page. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Nope, no, you're good. That. You're totally fine. Here we go. All right, sorry about that. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we can see okay. it. Okay, here we go. So I just wanted you to pay attention to what the midwife's doing in the background and how the mom is just listening to her body and doing what she needs to do to, to deliver her baby. <laughs>
stop it right there and stop my share and then share my other screen here. All right. All right, so again, I just wanted to show you that video because I just wanted to highlight that this is um, how most home births per um, go. A lot of times um, the, the moms are able to move in whatever position they like. We make sure that both the mom and baby remain um, stable and healthy the entire time they are at home. And, um, and again, um, transport generally occurs only about 10% of the time. And again, you guys don't see that. And so again, I, I wanted to just show you this video so you can see what a lot of home births might look like. Um, some people deliver in the water, some people deliver outside of the water on their knees, standing up, so many different positions, and we just make sure everything remains stable and good. And I could say so much about this video, and we could talk a lot about just about what normal birth looks like, but we are going to um, keep going with some of the things that um, more about collaboration between EMS and midwives. All right, so what improves the safety of home birth? There was a study done in 2018. Um, it was a midwifery integration scoring survey. And this showed that in the United States, higher scores were associated with significantly higher rates of physiologic birth, less obstetric intervention, and fewer adverse neonatal outcomes. So when providers can work together and midwives are integrated into the healthcare system, this is what we see. When there's poor coordination of care across providers, which include midwives and EMS and birth settings, um, this has been associated with adverse maternal newborn outcomes. So again, research suggests that we need to integrate midwives more into the system and that we need to collaborate more um, and understand each other's um, viewpoints and protocols and respect that. And so when that happens, um, uh, great outcomes occur. I just wanted to highlight this map that shows that in the darker purple, that, was, that shows that they're um, that the midwives are well integrated into the medical care system and the lighter shades show that they're not as integrated. And so we have some work to do, as you can see, but we're going to get there as the, um, as we continue to do um, presentations like this, where we get to know each other more and um, continue to work together to provide excellent care for our clients. All right, so one of those things that is needed for improved outcomes is communication. And this involves communication between dispatch and EMS. I know that a lot of times some of the EMS workers have expressed to us, we don't know what we're walking into when uh, there is a birth call. They don't know that a midwife is on scene. And so we, we need to work on that type of communication. So dispatch to EMS um, when they arrive at the home and then communication between EMS and the licensed midwife. EMS needs to know that there is a licensed midwife on scene so they can prepare for that. And the midwife needs to let them know who they are and what they need. And then obviously communication to the providing hospital. Um, that is essential in providing great outcomes as well. So if we're gonna lay a great foundation for communication, it involves a lot of respect. And so first of all, it involves respecting the mother's choice to choose an out of hospital birth. Um, this is becoming, um, uh, out of hospital birth is increasing um, quite a bit every year. And um, the states that have just become licensed, we at least here in Michigan, we've seen a large jump in out of hospital births, um, partly due to our license, but then also partly due to COVID, I believe. And so that is exciting. And we need to just respect that choice that the mother chooses um, as she feels is best for herself and her baby. We need to respect each other as professionals and work together. Um, we need to understand the best way to make contact with each other and give reports. So midwives need to understand how, um, it, um, what works best to give report to you and um, how we can work together in that. 
Um, we also, one important aspect of, of good um, communication is when you're entering the home of the mother, um, that you enter it in a way that is respectful and honoring of the situation that's at hand. Generally, the mother um, it could be experiencing something very traumatic and um, wanting to stay home was the plan and now her plans have changed. And, um, and especially in a birth of environment, we want to remain calm and um, respect the mother's privacy in some cases. Um, this can all, um, and then also when entering the home, um, having a very um, respectful conversation with the midwife can all put everybody at ease um, in a transport situation. Um, again, uh, we need to know and implement obstetric emergency skills effectively, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then after, if there is a transport situation, it could be really helpful to debrief between all of the providers to say, what did we do well and what could we do better? So the respectful communication with a midwife between EMS personnel might look like this. When you arrive, the midwife should say, my name is, and I'm a certified professional midwife, and I need this. And then the EMS per personnel might say, what is the emergency? We are here to help. Working together to find the best solution to whatever the emergency is. The important thing is great communication. Um, here are some guidelines that we've discussed um, that midwives should follow um, when it comes to transport communication. A lot of times a midwife will discuss prenatally with the family transport situations and they'll identify the nearest hospital. Um, even though this isn't what the family might want, they should know that it is something that may need to occur. Um, we also need to um, call EMS and notify the OB, the receiving OB and pediatrician um, after calling e EMS. That way they know what they're going to encounter when um, we arrive at the hospital. Uh, upon arrival of EMS at the home or um, birth center, it's really important that as midwives, we communicate our title and our scope of practice and how we're trained. So if we're trained in NRP and we're in the process of doing that, we need to communicate that to EMS. Um, we need to communicate the current situation and essential information and what the immediate needs are. Uh, many times a midwife should accompany the client en route to the hospital per EMS protocols. Um, the, you would hand over clinical responsibility either for transfer or upon transfer at the hospital. And so this just depends on the emergency situation. And again, it requires everybody to work together in the moment because um, when we take time to acknowledge each other's scopes of practice and practice guidelines and understand that we both are professionals and there's a little bit of gray area when we meet in a transport situation, um, we just need to move through that situation in a respectful way. Here are some guidelines for communication for EMS. Um, when you do arrive, it's really important to introduce yourself and your provider level because we, we need to understand what you're able to help us with and maybe what you're not um, and introduce any other staff that are entering the home. Um, sometimes our, some clients prefer only a female. Um, if if um, there's a female available, they would only feel comfortable with a female entering the room in some cases. I, I've um, encountered that before. Um, ask for uh, the certified professional midwife's report. We have an extensive history about this client. We look again, I, that's why we talked about how we do prenatal care. Um, so we have all the details on the client. It's just that sometimes if we're in the midst of an emergency, a midwife not be, might not be able to provide those to you right away. But, um, but we, we do have all of that information. Um, and it's really important that we outline a plan um, and we discuss and assign roles for successful co-management of the mother and the newborn. Um, we need to keep lines of communication open during the care and address transport protocols early and clearly per your agency's policy. Um, again, this requires um, working together in a respectful manner 
uh, manner acknowledging our different scopes of practice. All right, so when it is time to transport, we're just gonna review some things here, some essentials that are important to remember. Um, if the CPM states that we have an emergency, generally um, think it is time to go. Because again, we're only calling you if there is an emergency and we need to get to the hospital quickly. Um, so always when you arrive on scene, always consider the management that a certified licensed midwife may have done prior to the EMS arrival or the management that she may be actively doing as EMS arrives at the home. We also need to anticipate the potential for a second unit to transport the newborn if the mother and baby need emergent care. So again, hopefully these things are communicated clearly before you arrive, but I know many times they're not. And so we just always wanna anticipate that because again, we could have two patients that need care. Um, and in that situation, we need to share our transport requirements per your agency's policy with the midwife and family to develop an ideal plan for transport. So we'll be communicating um, and hopefully collaborating well so that we can have a seamless transport and get to the hospital as quickly as possible. Um, I just wanted to take time to review what some scenarios would be that would require prompt and rapid transport. This list of that we're going to go over is not exhaustive by any means, but it is just some things that I wanted to highlight um, and um, yeah, and discuss. Um, so the first thing I wanted to look at are transport situations in labor. These are some reasons why we would be calling you while the mother was in labor. Um, there are times that maternal exhaustion or a need for pain relief is um, required. And so many times we will transport by private vehicle if this is the case. But if, if it's not the case and we need um, assistance um, with EMS, we would probably need assistance starting an IV. Um, um, that could be very helpful in this situation. Again, most transport situations out of that 10%, most are for um, pain relief or failure to progress. And so these are a lot of the situations and a lot of times we're not using EMS for this. Um, we may be experiencing abnormal maternal vital signs. If this is the case, the CPM, when you arrive, will be monitoring the client's vitals closely. Um, they'll be starting an IV if they're able to, if it's within their scope, or administering oxygen, depending on the situation. And in a situation like this, always be prepared for potential delivery en route. <clears throat> All right, another reason why um, EMS might be called in labor uh, is for non-reassuring or ominous fetal heart tones. When you arrive, the CPM may be changing the mother's position, um, either on her right side or, or left side, knee chest, and the patient must remain in the position where the fetal heart tones are best. So that uh, means that um, uh, transport needs to be in that position. And so um, otherwise a fetal demise might occur. So we also might be providing oxygen to the mother and we will continuously be monitoring fetal heart tones and assessing maternal vitals all the way to the hospital. Um, I, I know that many of, uh, I know that in Michigan, um, fetal heart tone Dopplers are not carried on rigs and so, um, this is why a midwife would need to go with her client to be able to monitor the fetal heart tones and make sure that they stay well. Um, really consider safe alternative positions for when you um, load and put the client um, on the stretcher, whatever way um, she needs to be on there to keep her baby alive. Um, you can uh, prop using pillows, um, ele elevating the uh, head of the stretcher, things like that. Um, we will call if there's bleeding in labor, significant bleeding. Um, this could be a result of a placenta abruption, placenta previa, vasa previa, or a uterine rupture. If this were to be happening, the CPM will be um, moving the client on her left side. 
um, with her feet elevated, um, continuously monitoring the fetal heart rate, continuously assessing maternal vitals, starting an IV. Um, if this, um, if there's any kind of significant bleeding in labor, rapid, rapid transport is necessary and immediate surgery upon arrival to the hospital will likely occur. So this really requires great communication between the midwife and EMS and also good communication with the receiving physician is essential so that they know what to expect upon arrival and to prepare for a cesarean. Another thing we might encounter in the field is a, something called eclampsia. So we, a lot of us have heard of preeclampsia, um, which is higher blood pressure that can cause things like placenta abruption. Um, but it also can turn into something called eclampsia where a mother has um, begins to have seizures um, either during pregnancy or in labor. If there is a CPM on scene, we would have helped the mother to the floor and clear the area of dangerous objects, make sure the airway is open, place the mother on the left side and wait for your arrival. Um, if this were the case, if the mother was having eclampsia, it's really important not to have sirens flashing because this could exasperate the, the seizures. Um, we um, do not wanna delay transportation in this case and um, I know that in some um, areas in Michigan, we um, the EMS providers carry magnesium sulfate. Some do not, and I don't know what your state's protocols are, but if you are able to administer magnesium sulfate, this would be um, the time to do it. And so, um, yes, and again, quickly going to the hospital. There's a situation called a cord prolapse where um, the cord comes before the head and the head um, com um, compresses the cord. And, um, and so if this is the case, I'm gonna take a drink real quick. You need to place the mother in a knee chest position. And this is what the CPM would be doing as well. Um, we need to make sure that the fetal head is elevated off the cord. And we do that by sticking our hand um, and pushing the head up off of the cord. Um, with this, we need to always monitor the fetal heart rate. Um, if this is not reassuring, reassuring we need to um, position the mom without discontinuing head displacement. We are going to make sure that this baby's heart rate is good and we are going to be keeping our head, our hand in there with the head off the cord. Transport maintaining pressure on the baby's head is essential. And generally the midwife will just hop right on the stretcher with the mom to make sure that the baby's head is off the cord until arrival at the hospital. I have known midwives to go straight into the OR with the mom um, with uh, maintaining that pressure off the cord. And um, really this saves the life of the baby. If we didn't do this, then again, we would have a fetal demise. So it's really important that we um, transport in this way. If you do encounter this situation, it's really important not to handle the cord and do not try to put the cord back in. Um, we would give high flow oxygen. If the baby delivers, so let's say we have a multi, uh, multip, a mom that's had many babies and she decides to push and she can push her baby out quickly, um, you need to prepare for resuscitation and postpartum hemorrhage. All right, so this is kind of just an example of what a prolapsed cord looks like. And then this is the knee chest position that most likely um, the mother would need to be in in order to save the baby's life. Another emergency that we um, could call you for is shoulder dystocia. So this is when the shoulders um, do not negotiate the pelvis after delivery of the fetal head. So just the head is born, but the shoulders are having a hard time. The CPM is really trained in um, performing different maneuvers very rapidly. So if you arrive on scene and the baby is still stuck, the midwife will be performing these maneuvers. Um, if you do arrive on scene and the baby is still not delivered, it may require assistance to move the mother in the into the different positions. But this is what will be happening when you arrive. 
hopefully um, when you arrive, the baby will already be born. And if that is the case, um, the baby will likely be needing um, resuscitation and the mother could potentially um, have a hemorrhage. And so we need to be prepared for that if you ever hear that there's a shoulder dystocia. Again, it's really important never to pull or twist the baby's head or neck in a situation like this. Um, these are some of the maneuvers we might be doing as midwives. One, it's called flip-flop. Um, and we it's basically trying to dislodge the baby's shoulder off the mother's pubic bone. Um, there's also something called the McRoberts maneuver that many of you might be familiar with. Um, so if this were the case, we would be moving the mom into different positions and doing these maneuvers. Um, so... There is um, surprise breach deliveries. Now, I will say that in the state of Michigan, um, breach, it, planned breach is allowed in certain circumstances for midwives outside of the hospital. I don't know what the rules and regulations are in the other states that are represented here, but that would be something to, to look at your state's regulations considering that. But if there was a surprise breach, the, um, the CPM is going to make sure the mom is in a position that allows the breach to dangle. We will encourage strong pushing when the presenting part is seen. So if, if you arrive and there isn't a presenting part yet, but then there is, we are going to make sure that this baby is um, born quickly after that. If the um, breech birth is progressing normally, a lot of times midwives will be very hands off because the baby is going to do certain maneuvers to, to, to come. And so we want to make sure we're not interfering with that. But if baby shows signs of distress, which midwives are, are aware of, or there's a deviation from normal, the midwife will perform breech maneuvers. In this case, if you arrive and there was a breach delivery, we definitely need to be prepared for a resuscitation and a postpartum hemorrhage. All right, so these are transport situations in the postpartum period. So many times, a very common one, a reason why we would transport after the baby was born would be because of a hemorrhage. Um, so what are some of the reasons a hemorrhage um, can occur? Sometimes it's trauma. So a lot of times midwives, we can suture first or second degree tears, but let's say the cervix tore or um, it's a third or fourth degree laceration that's causing um, extensive um, hemorrhaging, we would um, need to transport for that. Um, it could be because of a retained placenta. It could be because of uterine atony, which means the uterus won't clamp down or coagulation, um, blood clotting issues. And so if you were to come upon a scene where a midwife was there, um, they might be performing by manual compression. We might be massaging. Um, many of us, if it's within your protocol, administering uterotonics, uh, first, line of, um, first line drugs for that would be Pitocin. So we would be giving that. We potentially might need to be doing a manual, re manual removal of the placenta and in extreme situations, aortic compression. So if there is a hemorrhage taking place, a rapid transport to the hospital is crucial. I know that I've talked to a lot of midwives in these situations and they are managing the, um, the hemorrhage and they might not have an opportunity to start an IV. So when you get there, starting an IV uh, um, right away is really important because the more the mother hemorrhages, the harder it is to start an IV. And so we know that you guys are good at that. And that is something that we um, would really appreciate uh, upon arrival at the scene. Um, here I'm just showing what some midwives carry in the state of Michigan. It's called a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment. So this is this version does not inflate, and this um, helps um, shunt the blood to all the vital organs, and it really stabilizes the mom in the case of um, bleeding in labor or a postpartum hemorrhage. And so I just didn't want I wanted to. Um, have you guys be familiar with something like this because the midwife may be placing this on the mom if the hemorrhage is extensive enough or if she lives in a rural area and um, uh, transport is going to take a little bit of time. Another postpartum complication could be a compromised newborn. 
Um, this, uh, if this occurs and you arrive on scene, the CPM will likely be providing um, positive pressure ventilation and chest compressions if the NRP protocol indicates. Again, we are following neonatal, neonatal resuscitation protocols in this case. Um, we could be inserting an LMA according to NRP protocol. We, uh, many of us, um, at least in Michigan, carry a pulse oximeter. And so we would be placing that on the newborn. Um, if the baby is having a hard time transitioning, they might not need PPV, but they might just need blow by oxygen until arrival at the hospital. Um, this can occur in newborns as well. Um, and so in these cases, collaboration and rapid transport is essential to get these babies the help they need in a timely manner. Um, if you are considering neonatal care for our neonatal resuscitation, um, it's really important that we provide warmth to the baby. We're going to talk about that in a minute here a little bit more. Um, as, uh, it's really important that the head and neck are positioned correctly in order to um, uh, make sure PPV is effective. Um, we need to clear secretions if needed, dry and stimulate the baby. And again, I just want to highlight here that we always follow um, neonatal resuscitation protocols and not infant CPR. There is a difference um, with newborns. And um, this is something in this picture you can see it's a resuscitator. Um, some CPMs carry this device and it helps position the baby um, in an optimal position for resuscitation. And many of the devices have um, a way of working with your pediatric transport devices um, to be able to strap the baby down in a safe way, but still maintain a great position for NRP. And so, um, yeah, I would just take a look to see if, um, uh, again, we're gonna talk to you about contacting your local midwife to see what they carry and how they, um, uh, and if they carry one of these, and if it, it if it works with how you guys um, transport your um, uh, newborns. <coughs> Let me just grab a drink here. Okay, so transportation of the newborn. Um, with transportation of the newborn, it's really, really important that the ambulance is very warm to preserve the newborn's body temperature. Um, there's been cases, I know that many of us um, encounter snow, right? And so, or we live in very cold climates. And so if you know that you're on a call to a birth and it's a birth emergency, um, make sure that your ambulance's heat is on high because um, when the baby enters the ambulance, it really needs to be warm in order to maintain the newborn's body heat because they can lose body heat very rapidly. Um, so we can do this by putting a cap on the baby's head, uh, making sure we have dry blankets. Some of you um, have tinfoil blankets to cover the baby with. Um, until it is time to go, um, if the baby is um, stable and can be skin to skin with the mom, that is where the baby should be because um, we're going to talk about a little bit later that skin to skin is always the best warmer for the baby. Um, a parent should accompany the newborn to the hospital whenever possible, but again, we always need to follow your obstetric and pediatric protocols for transport and the newborn should always be properly secured, but in a way that does not um, create a, a fetal death and so, or a newborn death. And so we wanna make sure that um, if PPV is needed on the way to the hospital that we um, strap the baby in um, so that we can continue um, resuscitative protocols. Um, we also wanted to highlight here that some of you might be, um, depending on your state's protocols, using chemically activated warming devices. Um, we just wanted to just have a word of caution that these products can reach very high temperatures and cause burns if they're not used properly. So make sure to follow your manufacturer's instructions carefully and do not place the infant directly on it um, or strap it to the infant or do not place <clears throat> on bare skin and do not leave by O2, oh, sorry. <laughs> Consult your EMS protocol for use on this. So again, this is just a word of caution if you still have these a part of your protocol. 
All right, so we're gonna, we just got done talking about different emergencies and how we can work together in those and just a little bit about what we as midwives will be doing. And I, again, I just wanted you to make sure that you review your protocols as um, EMS providers on how you would handle birth situations and then come up with a, um, a collaborative um, way of uh, working together with the midwife in a transport situation because we both have certain protocols we need to follow and um, we want to make the transport situation as seamless as possible. And so I wanted to end here before we get to questions, because I want to make sure we leave enough time for questions, um, with reminders for a birth progressing normally. So um, I, you guys may be encountering birth without a midwife in the field, and maybe a lot of you have before, and we just want to... Um, uh, highlight a few reminders that uh, hopefully won't make birth as scary if you get that call that you are going to a mom that's in labor. <laughs> and so just remember that birth is normal, natural, and it works the majority of time. So you can take a deep breath and, and just remind yourself of that. Remind yourself that pregnancy is not a disease. So it's very normal. Women have been giving birth for a very long time. If you arrive on the scene and the mother is in active labor or pushing instinctively, let her birth while monitoring the mother's vitals. So you kind of saw that in the video, the mom was moving in different positions um, and uh, getting in the right position for her. And so just make sure that this, um, the area around her is, is safe, of course, but let her move and push instinctively. When the baby starts to emerge, um, make sure you just have your hands off, but ready to catch, okay? Because if we try to manipulate this baby in any way, we could actually cause an emergency. So we're going to be pretty hands off as the baby starts to emerge. The baby's head, you'll see, begins to crown, and then the head will be born. Once the head is born, the baby goes through different um, cardinal movements, they call them, different um, maneuvers to um, negotiate the pelvis. And so um, the shoulders will be delivered and then the rest of the body. And so just be prepared to catch the baby and hand the baby to the mother. And it's always kind of important to just um, recognize how long or short the cord is. Because if the cord is really short, you might not be able to hand the baby all the way up to the mother's chest. The baby might need to sit on the mother's abdomen for a little bit. But in these situations, it's always really important to keep the environment calm. Because as we know, um, birth requires uh, um, complex hormones working optimally in order to keep the birth safe. And as midwives, that's what we try to promote is an environment that allows those hormones to work well, because that is what keeps birth safe. So when we keep the environment calm, that will allow the mom to do what she needs to do and the baby do what it needs to do to be born. When the immediately after the birth, make sure to place the, the baby skin to skin on the mom and cover with a warm, dry blanket. Again, the mom is the best warmer. Um, monitor the mom and baby's vitals every at least 15 minutes to make sure all is stable. It does take time for the newborn to transition. And so again, APGAR scores are generally done at one minute and five minutes. And I know um, it can be quite intimidating seeing a baby that is um, uh, purple after birth, but um, within that minute, the baby should pink up and the baby should have good tone. And so um, just allow that time of transition. And then if baby is not doing well after a minute, then you, you begin um, a resuscitative efforts. Um, again, encourage the mom to have, um, uh, to nuzzle the, um, or sorry, encourage the mom to breastfeed the baby if she's able, or at least have her nuzzle the breast, the baby nuzzle the breast. If this is happening, we know that the baby is doing well because a breastfeeding baby is a healthy baby and they will be ready. Many newborns will be ready and rearing to go for breastfeeding pretty soon after a birth. And then also when the baby starts to breastfeed, it begins to contract the uterus, which helps um, control bleeding. And so that is really important. Um, we also encourage delaying and clamping and cutting the cord for at least 30 to 60 seconds. Do not rush to clamp. 
This is really important, and this is something that ACOG um, now um, encourages as well. Um, this is almost like the baby gets its own blood back into them. It's like almost like a their own resuscitation, having that cord attached to them still because they're getting all of that oxygenated blood, which is really, really important. And I know old protocols say to clamp and cut the cord immediately, but it is showing that research shows that, that um, it is better for the cord to stay intact for a period of time. Again, keep the environment calm. Watch for bleeding with the placenta and monitor the amount of blood loss. It'll be really important to report that to the receiving provider um, because uh, we want to make sure that the mother remains stable and they will, <clears throat> they will continue to calculate that in the hospital. Um, watch for signs of the placenta detaching. Uh, this looks like maybe a small separation gush. So there'll be a little bit of bleeding after the birth or when the placenta comes and the cord will start to get um, longer. Um, it'll, you'll, you'll see the cord, um, more of the cord um, coming out of the introitus. Um, before the placenta is out, do not massage the uterus or pull on the cord. This could break the cord or cause a uterine inversion. Um, or it could um, cause some of the placenta uh, to be left inside the uterus retained. So we do not want to do either of those things. Just continue to monitor blood loss and the mother and baby's vitals the entire time. Sometimes it can be helpful to encourage um, the placenta by having her in an upright position. And um, if you the mother reports some cramping or pressure, you can encourage her to push the placenta out. And once the placenta is delivered, sometimes there's trailing membranes. Do not pull them out. Have the mother push or cough them out and guidely gent them, guide, gently guide them out. Sorry, um, because we don't want any fragments left inside the uterus. And then as you transport, once the mom and baby have had a little bit of time to bond um, and you are transporting, make sure you are um, massaging the uterus until it's firm and then monitor that um, on the way to the hospital, monitor her and the baby until arrival at the hospital. So I just wanted to yeah, end with what normal birth looks like. And I know many of you might encounter that in the field without a midwife on the scene. And so we just wanted to highlight that. And then to end, please take time to connect with your local midwife. A lot of um, states have midwifery associations where you can find a midwife near you. If you do, they would love to possibly teach a childbirth class um, and they would love to get to know you more. And consider a transport debrief if you do have a transport situation. Um, again, talk about what went well, what could be improved on for future calls if you have that opportunity to do that with a midwife. Um, promote communication and collaboration. This is, ex, um, this is super important to provide exceptional care to our clients and families and be proactive in this discussion and plan for future labor calls because this will improve our outcomes. Because again, this is new to many of us. Um, many states, we just got licensed. And so um, everybody's trying to figure each other out and we want to make sure that we are providing our clients with the best care possible. Um, I am open for questions, uh, but here is my email and um, and Dr. Mishra's uh, email as well. And so, yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic overview. And we do have some really, really wonderful questions. Um, so I've got them organized. I'm going to field them to you um, and kind of keep them in a couple categories here. Um, there was a lot of interest to discuss a little bit more about um, tub deliveries and water deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to share like a couple of the sentiments so that you can kind of teach on that a little bit. It says, I've, I've heard of um, water births before. Are there any other therapeutic and medical purposes for delivering in the water? Um, do many home births utilize a tub or is this just one option for mothers to choose? 
Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times a, a tub is used for pain relief. So we cannot, I didn't mention this, but we cannot provide any um, pharmaceutical pain relief medications during labor. And so we use um, a lot of things such as um, warm water, warm shower, um, warm bath, warm tub. And so a lot of um, moms end up delivering in um, a birth pool a lot of midwives um, definitely have that as an option for clients if they would like to do that. Um, as you can see in the video, the mom was in the tub for a while, thought she would deliver in the tub, and actually she delivered outside of the tub. And that happens really um, very often as well. And so it is um, proven to be a safe way for moms to deliver their babies. And I would say, um, I don't know. I mean, most midwives will allow that or provide that for their clients. I can't really say how many actually choose it. I would say maybe at least 25 um, to 30 percent of my clients choose it, but um, I think it varies upon midwives. So that's perfect, Sarah. Another area that generated quite a bit of com comments and questions, which I think is fantastic, so we can address them all together, is related to cord um, handling as well as delayed clamping. So I'm going to give you a few and then we can talk about it. Also, I'm sorry, my son is chiming in. So if he's being really loud, please let me know. Um, with delayed cord clamping, do we need to worry about the position of the baby? No, no, generally with delayed cord clamping. So a lot of times as midwives, we won't even cut the cord until the placenta is delivered. And so generally the, the baby's breastfeeding with the cord attached and um, it's still pulsing. And so when it stops pulsing, we know that the placenta is um, detaching. And um, so, yeah, there's really, if sometimes I think um, if the baby kind of needs um a little jump start. Um, sometimes we'll put the the baby be, um, un, below the mom's um, vaginal um, area so that um, more blood flow goes to the baby. But um, most of the time, the baby is goes right to the mom's chest or abdomen right after the birth. So excellent, thank you. And to that effect, um, what is the ideal time to leave the um, umbilical cord? um, before you do the clamping? I know this is a tough one, but yeah, this is a tough one. I will say, so we know that ACOG says at least 30 to 60 seconds. We know that research states that, um, the longer the cord is, um, intact, the, the better. So it's a really, uh, it's, it's beneficial to the baby. More and more research is showing that how it benefits the baby, less, um, less anemia in the baby. Um, uh, better outcomes with the cord staying intact. Um, I know in developing countries, uh, we have clients who leave the cord intact because as the cord shuts down, there's less um, of a chance for infection when you go to clamp and cut the cord, right? Um, in areas where there maybe um, or is lower resourced. And so, um, so yes, there's just a lot of benefits to not clamping and cutting the cord right away. Now, there are certain scenarios where you might need to if the baby is severely compromised and you need um, to transport the baby immediately. Um, that would be a situation where you would discuss that with the midwife and um, maybe clamping and cutting the cord would be necessary. But it's not something to do right away because that is a way of resuscitating the baby is making sure the baby is getting um, uh, that highly oxygenated blood to them from the placenta. Thank you, Sarah. Another um, group of questions is a little bit more about midwifery practice. And so you may have to answer this with your own experience or with Michigan, but we can also encourage folks to reach out to their own state um, providers as well. Is it possible to get midwifery care just for postpartum care? And does insurance often cover midwifery care? Oh, great question. So um, insurance is going to vary state by state. Um, of some insurances cover it here in Michigan. Um, and we're really working on getting Medicaid coverage here in the state so we can provide, um, so everybody has access to midwifery care. Um, 
Postpartum care, it would vary by midwife. Um, if a client contacted me personally and they said they would just like postpartum care, I would definitely consider that because we really do um, emphasize really great postpartum care within our care. And I know that there's a lot of postpartum doulas out there that do a really good job with post just postpartum care as well. And so there's lots of options for that. But yeah, I think if, if a client wanted just postpartum care, because sometimes we do transport a client or we need to refer a client um, in pregnancy and um, we'll continue to be with them and almost be with them at the hospital like a doula. And then we'll continue with their postpartum care after they have a hospital delivery. Fantastic. Um, related to medications and some interventions, and again, keeping in mind, this may be Michigan specific, um, other than providing oxygen, are you able to provide other medications to the mother or the baby? Um, is that situational? It depends on your state and what your state allows a midwife to carry. So in the state of Michigan, um, we can carry oxygen. We can also um, start an IV. We carry IV fluids. We also carry antibiotics for group B strep. If a mother is group B strep positive, we also um, carry uh, different anti-hemorrhage drugs such as Pitocin and Cytotec. Again, these are only used um, to uh, stop a hemorrhage. They are not used to induce a labor. A midwife should never do that out of the hospital. Um, and we provide vitamin K and erythromycin for the baby. Um, and so again, this varies by state. So um, I know some states don't allow their midwives to carry any medications. Some are only allowed to carry, um, let's say, Pitocin. And once you give two doses of Pitocin, then you have to transport, you know, so um, protocols and regulations and rules are all different. So fantastic. Thank you for reviewing that. Um, how rare are maternal hemorrhages mm -hmm. in the home birth? Oh, I don't know a particular statistic, but if we are transporting the mom, it's generally for a postpartum hemorrhage. So, um, and there's so many very variables when it comes to that. Obviously, we are always um, making sure that the mom is low risk and is not um, at risk for a hemorrhage after birth. If that were the case, we would need to... Um, refer um, or tra uh, transfer them to another provider, but um, we are always pre pre prepared for a postpartum hemorrhage because you could have a perfectly healthy mom and she could hemorrhage. And so, um, so yeah, that's why we, we are always prepared for these emergencies. Absolutely. And to that effect, um, can you speak just a bit more about where or when a hemorrhage might be more likely to occur in that birth timeline? Is there like any per particular time that folks should be paying the most attention to be looking for warning signs? Um, so it could, could occur at any point. Generally speaking, we're monitoring um, the mother very closely once the baby is born. Um, we're checking her pulse to make sure it's not rising, right, um, to see if she has maybe uh, um, internal, any internal bleeding that we aren't recognizing, her uterus filling with blood, but she's not actively showing any signs of bleeding. So we're really paying attention in that um, while we wait for the placenta to come. If the placenta doesn't come within 30 minutes, um, the rate of uh, potential postpartum hemorrhage definitely increases significantly. So you definitely want to see a placenta within 30 minutes, but hopefully you'd be transporting to the, to the hospital in that time if you were on your own. Um, if the placenta is not coming, yeah, that would be a reason for a hemorrhage. Um, sometimes we see it right after the birth. If, if a mom has had many babies or she's had some kind of, if she has a large baby, again, I some of the, a lot of those scenarios um, that you saw like shoulder dystocia, breech delivery, all of those things disrupt the hormones that um, occur naturally in birth and so could cause the mom to hemorrhage or, and cause her uterus not to clamp down. That's why we want oxytocin, right, to be flowing um, strongly during birth. So that's why we want to keep the birth um, area calm and uh, make sure the baby starts to breastfeed right away because that helps clamp the uterus. 
um, down after birth. So again, we are always on the lookout for a hemorrhage. It's not something, um, there's definitely risk factors for hemorrhage, um, especially if you're a mom that has had many babies. Um, if you're a first time mom, um, it really ranges, so. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, um, I think we have time for just one more brief um, question. There's a lot more that have come in, so I will work on compiling those and working with you on probably looking to put a little answer sheet together. But um, one of the discussions was about blow by oxygen for that newborn who might be having a little bit of a tough time transitioning. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our earlier speakers talked about care of pediatric patients, which I just want to remind people that are learning tonight. We know this, but just remember newborns are in a class of their own. And the newborn who is freshly just born and is in a very different physiological state than a newborn who's a day old, two days old, three days old, a week old, or a month old. So Sarah, yeah. can you talk just briefly on that importance of that transition period and maybe just a little bit about why they might need oxygen and why blow by can be effective for the newly born infant? Okay, so we don't really obviously have the ability to mix oxygen with room air. And so we that's why um, many midwives carry a pulse oximeter and there's certain target ranges that the baby should be in after birth. And so what we generally do is um, just put the oxygen on the baby to where the baby is within the range that is appropriate for how old the baby is. We don't wanna give 100% oxygen in that case if a baby is just having some transition issues. We just want to make sure they're within the target range. And so um, we, we as midwives, we monitor that by looking at the pulse ox and um, holding the, ox the blow by oxygen to where the baby needs it to get enough to um, stabilize and transport. I don't know, Sam, if you have any more about, you know, giving 100% oxygen to. Uh, no, it's fantastic. And honestly, um, just to reiterate, and I see a comment in the, on the chat is just reiterating the importance of neonatal resuscitation. Midwives mm -hmm. are trained on NRP. Um, so in many of our states, NRP is actually not required as an EMS provider license level uh, requirement. Um, and so in fact, we can actually learn quite a bit um, and work together there, always consulting your protocols, obviously. Um, there are so many other questions that continue to come in. So I'm going to be pulling those into a Word document while Erica handles our wrap up messages so that we can give everyone instructions about CEs. And thank you, Sarah. Amazing job as always.